Hello and welcome everyone to the webinar Introduction to Titanium Dioxide. My name is Martin von Wolfersdorf. I will be your host today. So let's head over to PowerPoint and start the presentation. This is actually take two. Uh, the webinar recording did not work, so this is a re-recording. I hope you have fun. So, um, we don't need to go through the troubleshooting recommendations because uh, today we are not live, we are recording. We are starting with a couple of words about me and this is a funny way I found to do uh, uh, the introduction of Wolfersdorf Consulting with the uh, CLAB system. Because I worked 14 years uh, with a company called uh, ICI, Tioxide and Huntsman Tioxide where I worked in titanium dioxide research and development, technical service, sales and marketing. Then I spent two years in colors with uh, a plastic master batcher called Americam, um, both, by the way, in uh, United Kingdom, in England. And then I finished off the color sphere in the uh, dark hemisphere with carbon black, working for Cabot in Schaffhausen, Switzerland. Since 2014, I'm a freelance advisor and I'm helping the whole color sphere uh, growing, uh, both titanium dioxide, carbon black and everything in between. These are some of my reference clients. Um, admittedly, many of them are in the uh, carbon black or recovered carbon black color sphere. And I've highlighted uh, to you some of my titanium dioxide clients. For example, I've helped uh, INEOS acquire the assets of Ashtabula, a very nice uh, chloride plant, uh, titanium dioxide plants. I've helped uh, the uh, plastic master batch company Compuestos sell master batch, procure titanium dioxide and also carbon black. Um, I worked with Danone Evian on the uh, food safety of uh, yogurt packaging, uh, white uh, um, plastic containing titanium dioxide, especially um, uh, in the context of the uh, recent classification for titanium dioxide. And I uh, uh, helped uh, Covris, a packaging company, procure 6,000 tons of uh, master batch per year, including a white master batch, uh, black master batch, all the colors and additive master batch. So what are we looking at today? Uh, we'll do a quick overview on titanium dioxide. We'll look at uh, the size of nano titanium dioxide and pigment titanium dioxide. We'll cover crystal forms. Uh, we look at uh, how a uh, typical plastics titanium dioxide pigment will look like. Uh, we're looking at photoactivity. Then we look at uh, the two uh, main manufacturing processes for titanium dioxide. There is actually a third one, but uh, which is not yet uh, fully commercialized. We look at the five uh, biggest titanium dioxide manufacturers. Then we look at the finishing process. Uh, we look at how to... Uh, select titanium dioxide pigments for plastics um, and uh, we look at what kind of pigments would not work for plastics applications. We look a little bit at uh, pricing and the drivers for price and price volatility. Uh, we look at uh, alternatives and substitutions for titanium dioxide but I can also always uh, right now pre-empty uh, there is no alternative and no substitution for titanium dioxide. We'll look at um, typical um, titanium dioxide quality issues and quality control and my very own opinion on the market potential of emerging suppliers. Uh, we'll look at titanium dioxide sustainability and the uh, carbon dioxide burden. Uh, this is a topic very close to my heart and I work on this topic uh, both in the white hemisphere and in the black hemisphere. Uh, and then we look at the nano discussion, uh, the... Um, uh, whether titanium dioxide pigments contain nanomaterial and if so, how much is the nano content uh, in typical pigments. We look at the current reality, which is the um, uh, classification by uh, the European Chemicals Agency. And uh, then I will make a comment about the assimilation routes, which I think uh, puts the uh, classification, the ECHA classification into context. So, uh, this is a slide just showing uh, who 
participated in the webinar. Again, this is a recording. Unfortunately, we don't have these companies uh, right now live. Um, we had uh, one retiree from Axalta, the former um, DuPont Industrial Coatings. Uh, we have a participant from uh, the master batch company Rapid Color. Um, I'm very uh, glad and uh, it's an honor for me that uh, Jack Blumfrucht from Fairmont International, a titanium dioxide expert, is uh, or has attended the uh, webinar. We have uh, three distribution companies, Raycam, uh, Plymouth Global and uh, Derby Trading. Thank you very much and uh, have fun with this uh, recording. So this is a, a quick um, briefing on titanium dioxide. What is the molecular formal? Uh, it is a titanium uh, dioxide. So we have two oxygen and one titanium atom. Um, we have two crystal forms, anatase and rutal, which we will explain a little bit later on. We have two manufacturing processes, which we will detail a little bit later on. Um, what is the value of titanium dioxide? It is mainly opacity, it could be also whiteness, it could be UV protection, it could also be photoactivity, and what I'm not mentioning here, it could also be a chemical additive. Um, there is a big difference between pigments and uh, nanotitanium dioxide, which we will look at in a moment. In terms of abundance, uh, titanium is the ninth uh, most uh, abundant element uh, on the Earth. Um, however, uh, it, uh, its content is only 0.565%, so it's not a lot, uh, and yet uh, we have uh, a very big uh, industry built on that uh, volume. Uh, in terms of the markets, in 2016, the market for titanium dioxide was uh, 6.5 million metric tons. The forecast for 2025 is 8.8 .8 million metric tons, uh, which is about... Uh, and that's a, a funny fact, it's, uh, which is about a half of what the uh, carbon black market is. Um, the majority of uh, applications are in coatings and inks, 57%. Uh, then come plastics with 25%, paper 12%, and uh, other applications including FDC. Uh, FDC is food, drugs and cosmetics. That was... Um, uh, mar that were markets I was responsible for at uh, Huntsman Pigments um, selling to a company called uh, Sentient uh, that was the sole and exclusive distributor for these kind of uh, products uh, the output uh, from Huntsman Pigments sources for this market data were uh, IHS, TDMA uh, the Titanium Dioxide Manufacturing uh, Association and also uh, Rack Adams um, article now, what is important for titanium dioxide, and we'll get back to that uh, over and over, um, th I think the most, uh, the highest added value or the biggest uh, pro um, property for titanium dioxide is the refractive index, which makes that anything with titanium dioxide uh, in it is uh, opaque. And uh, here's a, a little mistake. Uh, we actually see uh, the correct refractive index uh, later on. Um, the refractive index of titanium dioxide is between 2.55 and uh, 2.71. Zinc oxide has a refractive index of uh, just about uh, above 2. Uh, barium sulfate, which is oftentimes blended into cheap Chinese uh, titanium dioxide pigments, uh, is only 1.6 calcium carbonate uh, under 1.6, fumed silica, which for example is also produced by um, Cabot, uh, has a refractive index of 1.4, and we see there's nothing quite like uh, titanium dioxide. Size matters. Uh, let's look at the size of uh, nanotitanium dioxide and titanium dioxide pigments. So um, in terms of the nanotitanium dioxide, we both have uh, anatase and rutile crystal forms. And uh, in terms of the size in uh, microns, we have 0 0.005 micron up to about uh, point, um, 1 micron, 100 uh, nanometers, uh, quite small. Uh, in, uh, of, um, and the um, nano titanium dioxide is transparent because of that. Uh, the light is not broken uh, at these um, particles. 
What is it used for? Uh, UV protection for um, plastic films, for example, agricultural uh, films. Uh, it's used in uh, cosmetics, in your sunscreen. Uh, it's used in paints, um, catalysators, uh, and for cleaning and uh, disinfection purposes. Uh, there's two processes. Uh, we'll get back to that uh, a bit uh, later on. Actually, at the uh, ending of this uh, presentation, uh, there's the sol gel process and the calcination process. Now, the vast majority of titanium dioxide is uh, titanium dioxide pigments. And uh, here we have, uh, for example, anatase pigments uh, with an average size of 0.15 micron. Um, the advantage is it, uh, they have a really nice bluish white. Uh, applications are uh, food, drugs, cosmetics, but also plastics, inks and uh, fibers, synthetic fibers. And the process to manufacture anatase is the sulfate process only. Then we have uh, the rutal crystal um, with a size uh, of about 0.21. This is a fine crystal used in plastics. Also, uh, this is uh, a bluish white and uh, the main application is uh, plastics. Uh, the process can actually be the sulfate or the chloride process. Then we have uh, rutal paint grades and they're uh, average particle size is slightly bigger, about two point, uh, 0 0.26 microns, uh, which uh, gives us uh, a more yellowish, a creamy white uh, used in uh, decorative or architectural paints. And the process could be either the sulfate process or the chloride process. And then we have uh, the large crystal form of rutile pigments, um, and the crystal size would about uh, be about uh, 0.33 microns, and uh, we definitely have uh, a cream uh, color, and this is used for infrared reflection. And the process typically is the uh, sulfate process. We talked a lot about the two different crystal forms. Let's look at how the crystal structure of anatase and rutile looks like. Both are tetragonal, but the rutile crystal is uh, denser. So it has a higher refractive index, and the hardness is higher, as we can see in this table. Also, the uh, specific material gravity is uh, a slightly higher because of that denser packing. Um, the anatase, interestingly, has a 10 times higher photoactivity than rutile, um, which makes that for any application um, outdoors uh, where UV stability is a topic, um, only rutile pigments are to be used. The production volume of anatase is about 780 kilotons, uh, that is metric tons per annum, uh, and the rutile production volume is about 5,720 kilotons per year. Uh, in terms of the production processes, which uh, we will uh, detail on a bit later on, the anatase can only be manufactured with the sulfate process, and the rutile can be manufactured both with the sulfate and the chloride process. Let's look at a pigment. This is a very, very uh, schematic sketch of a plastics pigment. Um, so we have uh, the, the white core, which is the titanium dioxide. And then uh, we have crystal doping. And the um, detailed explanation will follow in the next slide when we talk about photoactivity. Uh, let's just say the titanium dioxide crystal is doped with other materials in order to prevent photoactivity. Then we have an inorganic coating, which again helps trapping electrons created by the photoactivity of titanium dioxide. We could have, for example, 1 to 6% of alumina, uh, which is um, aluminium oxide, and we could have uh, up to 3% uh, silica, which is uh, silicon dioxide. And then we have an organic coating, and this is really depending on the application. It could be very simple TMP um, uh, organic coating. Uh, TEA coating, uh, triethanol amine coating, is no longer used uh, for regulatory purposes. Um, plastics pigment could have a siloxane pigment uh, coating, and uh, the high-performance plastic pigments might have a silent or NOPA um, coating which is actually chemically attached to the uh, inorganic coating. The uh, organic coating is typically difficult to identify on a titanium dioxide pigment. Uh, what can be easily identified is the uh, carbon content, uh, and this is measured by TGA, thermogovermetic uh, analysis, 
and the typical carbon content is between 0.2 and 0.3 percent. So let's look at photoactivity. Uh, why is this uh, so important? And for titanium dioxide, the photoactivity is created because the conductor band is so close to the valence band. So uh, it doesn't uh, need a lot of energy uh, by light, which is uh, here indicated by the HV. Uh, uh, so if uh, UV light of uh, the wavelength of less than 380 nanometers falls on the titanium dioxide, um, the uh, photon lifts can or can lift an electron into the uh, conductor band. And then we have all sorts of um, photoactive uh, reactions uh, on both sides. And we're creating um, molecules like superoxide, like peroxide and like hydroxyl. These are highly um, reactive um, components and uh, they will destroy, for example, a plastic uh, polymer matrix or a uh, paint uh, film polymer matrix. Uh, so we don't want that, of course, uh, which is the reason why all commercial pigments are stabilized. And uh, they are double stabilized, uh, both uh, they are doped uh, with other uh, materials that can trap uh, electrons or uh, free radicals within the uh, titanium dioxide pigment. And then uh, if that uh, is not enough, uh, they're also coated with various uh, inorganic coatings. Um, the most efficient inorganic coating being the dense silica coating uh, in combination with a round chloride process um, core. Um, why, you will ask, uh, chloride process? The chloride process, which we'll uh, detail a little bit later on, is producing more round-shaped uh, pigments, whereas the sulfate process is uh, producing more needle-shaped pigments. And uh, it's uh, just more, much more easier to coat or fully coat a round pigment uh, than it is uh, to coat a, a needle-shaped uh, pigment. So, um, but photoactivity can also be a value creation. For example, we have self-cleaning applications because the photoactivity can destroy organic matter uh, like pollutants, uh, smelling gases, uh, and we have oxidative uh, degradation. Uh, which produces out of organic uh, substances carbon dioxide and water. We can also oxidize inorganic matter, um, like, uh, for example, um, oxides, uh, uh, nitrous oxides, uh, ammonia uh, or cyanides. And uh, I think uh, in the context of the recent uh, pandemic, it's quite interesting. Um, I have found uh, two quotations. Uh, that suggests that actually bacteria, fungi uh, and viruses, including the COVID-19 virus, uh, might actually be uh, slowed uh, in their uh, spreading uh, by uh, photoactive uh, surfaces containing titanium dioxide. Now let's look at manufacturing processes, uh, starting with the sulfate process. This process is actually a very complex process. Um, it's a complex slide. Uh, it takes days uh, for uh, manufacturing. Um, in the uh, gray box, you see uh, uh, what you have to uh, um, what you have to know about the sulfate process. The sulfate process is a liquid process, liquid phase process, where the slag actually is completely dissolved in sulfuric acid, and then the titanium dioxide is precipitated selectively. Um, it's a slow process, as I said, takes uh, days. Um, also, um, we are generating uh, a fair amount of waste, 3.5 tons of waste per ton of titanium dioxide, uh, which makes that um, the uh, top tier companies that use the sulfate process have to do a uh, materials business, a recycling business. Very often, the uh, um, materials uh, created out of that waste business are fertilizers, uh, but also uh, concentrated or diluted uh, sulfuric acid. This kind of process we find in Europe, but also in China. And uh, as mentioned, the crystals are in needle shape. Now there's two variants of the sulfate process, um, depending on what kind of um, feedstock we're using. Uh, if we're using concentrated slag, uh, we don't need to reduce the iron. If we have uh, ilmenite uh, containing uh, iron-3, uh, we need to uh, reduce the iron by um, putting recycled iron uh, into uh, the process. 
Um, and then we see the, um, the process uh, sequence after the acid digestion. Uh, we put flocculants, uh, we do clarification and crystallization, uh, followed by hydrolysis, filtration and washing, uh, adding of uh, nuclei, um, and then uh, we uh, do uh, leaching, filtration, washing. At that point, uh, we have uh, anatase crystals, and uh, those anatase crystals are put into the calcination, uh, where we're adding doping additives, which could be aluminium, uh, which could be potassium, uh, phosphorus, or uh, magnesium. And uh, in the calcination, depending on the temperature and the residence time, if you have a short calcination, uh, we stay with the anatase crystal modification. If you have a longer calcination, uh, we'll convert the anatase crystal into rutile crystals. Uh, then we'll have uh, milling and we go into the finishing process, which I will also explain in, um, in one of the subsequent slides. Let's look at the chloride process. Uh, so other than the sulfate process, the chloride process is a, a gas phase process, so it's uh, very rapid. Um, you might know that the, uh, the um, speed difference, a gas phase process uh, is up to uh, 30 meters per second. A liquid process, if it is fast, could be uh, 3 meters per second. But in the case of precipitation, uh, the liquid process is even uh, much slower than 3 meters per second. Um, the chloride process has um, not as much waste as the sulfate process. We have about 200 kilograms waste, um, and this is because um, essentially most of the uh, uh, chloride used for the chlorination is uh, recovered, is recycled. Um, the capacity um, is uh, about uh, 5 million uh, tons production. Um, these are very, very large installations. Uh, for example, I can remember um, the Hurricane Katrina wiped out about 7% of the global titanium dioxide manufacturing uh, capacity. Uh, and these were, uh, I think this was uh, one or two sites of DuPont uh, with uh, 300,000 tons um, production capacity. We're producing ground crystals. Uh, what is also important is the, the cost saving compared to the sulfate process. So we have uh, really have economies of scale uh, but we also have process uh, economies. Um, and uh, the leader for the chloride process uh, probably and surely is uh, Kimors, uh, the former DuPont Titanium uh, uh, Technologies. Uh, and um, I remember when being at uh, Huntsman, uh, the EBITDA uh, profits of uh, most of the normal uh, producers uh, were just under uh, 10%. And uh, the uh, DuPont uh, uh, EBITDA profitability was uh, like uh, 20 or 25 percent, uh, so much higher profitability of uh, the large scale uh, chloride process. So, what do we do? Uh, the feedstock is uh, rutile, slack, or ammonite. Uh, it needs to be a very pure feedstock uh, because essentially the whole feedstock is uh, chlorinated um, and we're producing tetra. Tetra is uh, titanium, uh, titanium tetrachloride, and um, this uh, tetra is uh, cooled. Um, there's added nuclei, um, uh, so um, um, we are adding uh, more tetra um, t for the, uh, the crystal growth. Um, we have a separation of gas and solids. Uh, we uh, condensate. Uh, we go into distillation. We reheat. And then we go into the uh, oxidizer, uh, where actually the uh, chloride or the uh, um, um, the chloride is converted into uh, oxide. At that point, because this is a, a very a quick gas phase process, uh, we have uh, rutile crystals uh, straight away, um, because the anatase phase is uh, um, is um, so short and the uh, the gas phase uh, process is so quick that we cannot stop the chloride process at uh, anatase. Um, the rutile um, titanium dioxide uh, is uh, cooled. We need to separate uh, the gas uh, from uh, the solids. Um, here uh, we, uh, we're taking the, um, um, uh, the Cl2 out. Uh, then we go into slurring, uh, we filter, and uh, we uh, finish the pigment with the finishing process. Let's look at the five uh, top 
titanium dioxide manufacturers. Actually, on this slice, uh, slide, you get a uh, bonus uh, supplier, uh, which is Ineos Pigments, and I will explain why in a moment. So you have already heard about uh, Kimurs. Um, Kimurs is the largest manufacturer of titanium dioxide with a global share of about 15%, um, manufacturing 1,250,000 uh, metric tons of titanium dioxide. The second uh, largest um, manufacturer is uh, Tronox, and uh, with a capacity, a uh, global share of 13%, and uh, with a... Uh, uh, with a chloric capacity of 942 and a sulfate capacity of 138 kilotons. This is including the former assets of Crystal uh, and before that uh, Lyondell Millennium. Um, and um, because of the Federal Trade Commission, um, they had to uh, um, diversify one site which was uh, acquired by the company Ineos and which turned into Ineos uh, pigments. That is the Ashtabula site. A very nice chloride site making high performance uh, paint and master batch uh, grades. Now, the last time I showed this slide, uh, the number three uh, was not Lomond Billions with a global share of 12%, uh, but they were uh, number four or number five. Um, so they are definitely uh, growing uh, and also, uh, it's very important to note that uh, Asia and China is building chloric capacity, which is perceived as the, the higher quality uh, and the blue or white uh, um, of uh, the both uh, process types. Number four is uh, company Venator Materials. This is the former Huntsman Pigments or the former Tyoxide Europe where I worked with a chloric capacity of 427 kilotons and a sulfate, uh, um, sorry, <laughs> with a sulfate capacity of uh, 427 tons and a um, chloride capacity of 230 um, kilotons. Number five is uh, Kronos. Kronos is a pretty much a specialized uh, company. Uh, they do a lot in specialty anatase, um, predominantly uh, chloride based. Uh, Kronos also has uh, the leading uh, window profile uh, PVC grade. Chloric capacity is uh, 422 kilotons and the sulfate capacity is 142 kilotons. And uh, as mentioned, in Neos Pigments, uh, this is one, uh, uh, actually two sites, but one, uh, one plant with uh, 245 kilotons capacity, 3% share. In Europe, uh, we have a number of uh, tier two players. Uh, for example, in Poland, uh, Police, 0.5% uh, of the capacity, uh, or Cinkana in uh, Slovenia, or um, Prichetza in uh, Slovak uh, Republic. This is um, sulfate uh, process capacity, uh, mainly specializing in uh, paint applications. Let's look at the finishing process. Uh, this is the process uh, I worked on when I was uh, a young R&D engineer joining ICI and Tyxide Europe. I worked uh, on, uh, on the band dryers. I worked on uh, micronizing uh, and also organic addition in the micronizing. So we come either from the sulfate or the chloride process and uh, we go into a uh, slurry. We're putting dispersant. Uh, we're washing a little bit with uh, caustic. Um, we go into the uh, liquid milling, uh, the bead mills. Uh, Seconium beads are used in that process. Um, we classify. There's a loop. Um, all the uh, coarse pigments are fed back to the liquid milling, uh, and only the um, the pigments uh, that are the proper size are passed on. Um, then we go to the inorganic coating. Uh, this is a combination. Actually, uh, we could do a whole webinar just on the inorganic coating. I remember at Huntsman uh, Pigments, we had the TN92 uh, coating story. TN92 is the uh, basic uh, sulfate paint grade of uh, Venato materials uh, back then, Huntsman Pigments. Uh, and there were like 12 stages of, uh, uh, of this coating process. Um, and every stage uh, was um, changing the pH or adding um, or taking out uh, certain things so that the final coating is as uh, desired. So what could be added? Um, alumina, uh, silica, 
uh, Seconia, um, also um, agents like caustic and acids in order to change the uh, precipitation rate. After the inorganic coating, uh, we go into filtration and uh, washing. Um, this is a liquid process, a very slow process again, um, and the, uh, the pigment is uh, picked up in the washing and the filtration on uh, big frames uh, with uh, screens and the pigment is uh, sucked by, by vacuum onto the screens. We go into the drying. Um, now this could be band dryers, uh, but this could also be um, a fluid dust bed dryers, uh, or spray dryers. Uh, not fluid dust bed, but uh, spray dryers. Um, then we go into the micronizing. Uh, these are steam mills um, in which we can also add organic coating. That was the case for the two pigments uh, I co-developed, uh, TR28 and TR48. Uh, where we're adding um, a chemically bound uh, organic, which is very, very stable, which does not actually detach from the titanium dioxide. And we have a chemical reaction in the uh, micronizer steam mill. Uh, after that, uh, we need to go into a uh, backhouse filtration um, and uh, then into packing. And the packing typically uh, could be bulk, could be a big bag, uh, or it could be... Um, plastic or paper bags. Let's look at how we select uh, titanium dioxide pigments. Um, in my career with Huntsman Pigments, I've worked uh, on uh, pigments for all applications. Uh, the most in uh, development, I've worked on pigments for plastics. So let's look at uh, plastics. Uh, I mentioned the high performance master batch application. Uh, for this, we want a fine crystal rutile pigment. Uh, fine crystals, so it has a bluish white. Uh, we put uh, some doping that could be uh, aluminium and could be others. Um, we can add inorganic coating, uh, but in the case of uh, high performance plastics where the extrusion temperatures are very, very high, uh, we actually don't want any inorganic coating. Um, uh, the least we have, the better, um, because for example, if we have alumina coating, um, Every um, mole of alumina can bind 18 moles of uh, water, of moisture. So um, we try to not to have alumina on plastic pigments because uh, this will tie in moisture. And the moisture uh, is creating uh, an effect uh, when we extrude, which is called uh, dye buildup or lacing, uh, because the moisture uh, will um, expand. Uh, in the extruder, we have a very high pressure and outside the extruder we have the uh, ambient pressure, uh, so we're talking about an expansion uh, and that will actually uh, destroy the, the film of the extruded plastic. We'll have uh, sprinkles of, uh, of the um, explosions of the gas uh, to, to the dye. Uh, then we have plastic material on the dye. The dye will be obscured uh, by uh, carbonizing plastic. Uh, so this is a number of um, bad things for plastic extrusion. Uh, we don't want uh, moisture on plastic pigments. And one way is uh, not having inorganic coating. Then the organic coating should be uh, chemisorbed. It could be a silane, uh, or in the case of Huntsman pigments um, or Venato materials, it could be NOPA. NOPA stands for N-octal phosphonic acid. Um, in any case, we want uh, the organic coating to be hydrophobic. Uh, which makes it compatible with uh, polymer systems. The added value is we have a bluish white, we have very high dispersibility, we have a good, uh, very high extrusion performance um, if the humidity is uh, low, and we have uh, printing and sealing performance. Um, the problem uh, with um, printing and sealing performance is when we go to universal plastic um, pigments, uh, that do not have chemisorbed organics, but physisorbed organics, uh, that organic uh, coating can uh, come out and stick on the surface of the plastic film, and then we cannot reliably print on it or we cannot seal uh, the film uh, onto another film. But back to high-performance master batch pigments, uh, that could be, for example, DuPont Type Pure R104. Uh, this is probably the grandfather of all high-performance master batch uh, pigments, uh, very successful from uh, Huntsman or Venator is Tyxide TR28, uh, where I worked in the development team. And the new one, uh, TR48, which is like an improved version uh, that I developed, but that was only um, 
introduced in the market on the uh, K show in 2019, uh, about eight years after I left the company. Uh, could also be Ineos RCL 188. That is a really good pigment uh, as well in RCL4 uh, or Tronox 8400 or Kronos 2500. All of these have the uh, chemisorbed silane or uh, N uh, Nopa um, organic. Well, um, not always um, do we need to use high performance master rich pigments. Um, there are also universal uh, plastic pigments. Um, they have the same crystal base, the um, fine crystal base. Uh, the doping might be the same as well, but the inorganic coating uh, is a little bit thicker, so we're uh, binding a little bit more no uh, moisture. And as, ma as I mentioned, the organic could be siloxane, and it is only fizzy sorbed. We still have the bluish white. We have good. We don't have the high dispersibility. We have uh, acceptable dispersibility, uh, but we get all sorts of problems. We get streak, uh, streams and deformation in the film, which is called lacing. Uh, in the extreme case, actually, the plastic film on extrusion looks like a sponge. We got plate out uh, in solids or thicker plastic um, plates. Uh, the organic uh, is coming out uh, on the surface. Or we get dye built up, uh, mentioned the uh, obscuring of the uh, extrusion nozzle, uh, and we surely get uh, printing and sealing issues. Um, pigments could be, for example, um, the Huntsman pigments or Venator, RC, um, uh, RFC5 um, or the 405 and others. Then um, if you want durable plastics, for example, as mentioned for PVC window profiles, we would use a chloride pigment, uh, which also is a fine crystal. Um, we would dope it, uh, but we th uh, would have a thicker coating, uh, which is uh, making uh, the pigment more uh, weather fast and uh, durable. The organic will be also a fizzy sorb organic. Um, in any case, it needs to be hydrophobic. Uh, we'll have uh, the bluish white. We have uh, durability, especially um, when we use um, the dense silica inorganic coating. Uh, and uh, pigments could be, for example, the type pure R103. Um, it could be uh, the uh, Venator or Huntsman pigments TC30, Tronox 8300. Um, or Chronox, uh, Chronos, which uh, has a number of really good pigments, uh, 2022 for PVC windows, uh, or the lighter coated uh, variants of uh, 20 tw uh, 22, 25, and 22, 22. Now, what is inappropriate for um, plastic uh, pigment use? Uh, and there's two examples I want to show you. Uh, the one is uncoated anatase. Um, why is it not suitable? Um, we talked about the uh, photoactivity. Um, it might be doped, but uh, it uh, does not have um, inorganic coating. Uh, so it will be, uh, chances are that it will be highly photoactive. Um, and also it will only have a fizzy sorbed organic coating, uh, which uh, creates the uh, already mentioned uh, problems. The only good, um, property we have is that the white will be quite bluish. Now, um, sometimes um, when the market demand is very high and the supply is very low, um, for example, um, plastics companies try to buy it uh, by Rutal paint grades. Uh, we've seen uh, in one of the first slides, the paint grade market uh, is much bigger. Uh, so maybe uh, in times of um, product shortness, we can get a paint grade, but not a plastic grade. Why is this bad? Um, the problem is the moisture. We have the inorganic coating, which will be quite thick and carry a lot of uh, moisture. Um, but also uh, we have the organic, which is a fizzy sorb, which might be detached, which uh, might uh, cause a, a number of problems. Uh, but the main problem is that it's hydrophilic. It's made actually for uh, wetting um, with water not wetting with uh, uh, polymer matrices. So uh, this will not work unless uh, we're using uh, a lot of uh, vacuum extraction of the gases. Uh, so we need to use uh, degassing, a lot of degassing in uh, during the extrusion of rutile paint grades uh, when we use them for plastics. 
Now let's talk a little bit about price. This is an introduction to titanium dioxide. It's not a, an in-depth market uh, webinar, uh, but I want you to understand um, uh, what, uh, um, how the pricing works and what are the, the main drivers uh, for pricing and pricing uh, volatility. Of course, um, at the beginning of the process, we have the feedstock. And uh, we here we have big companies, uh, the mining companies, uh, Rio Tinto, Iluca, um, BHP are the major players. Uh, Glencore is the, the world's uh, biggest mining company. Um, Tronox, interestingly, is uh, vertically in integrated. So they have their own mines, which is definitely a um, competitive uh, advantage. And then we have uh, two cycles of demand growth. We have uh, the micro cycle, which is in decorative paints. Uh, starting the season starting uh, each year in February to July um, and um, decorative paints are about 36% uh, 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 of the global market so this is quite important and the titanium dioxide makers are uh, carefully watching uh, how the uh, uh, decorative paint markets are developing every year. Then there's a macro cycle and uh, um, the macro cycle basically is following uh, GDP growth uh, as you can see on uh, the top right, uh, this is uh, sourced from uh, the uh, Kimur's website, um, and this is uh, this is the uh, the uh, the markets for uh, titanium dioxide over uh, a long, long time, starting in the 80s. And what we can see is um, the uh, growth of the markets is about 2.5 percent growth, uh, very close to the GDP growth. Um, then. Um, or um, interestingly, also um, a nice uh, chart from article Rec Adams uh, from the uh, European Coatings Titanium Dioxide Forum in 2018 is a uh, price forecast, and you can see the price volatility uh, and the drivers for uh, changes in in the pricing. Um, also, um, there is uh, geography is one of the price drivers. Uh, there's an imbalance of the chloride production, so we have a lot of chloride production in the U.S. Uh, and we have a lot of sulfate production in uh, Europe and China. And uh, most of the new capacity is added actually in uh, chloride production rather than sulfate production. And uh, the chloride availability coming from the US in Europe depends very much on how the economy is and how the exchange rate is. Uh, so this is pretty much a, a swing market um, where uh, US uh, titanium dioxide manufacturers um, if uh, the markets are promising and the uh, exchange rate is promising, are willing to export. Uh, but if uh, the, uh, those uh, boundary conditions change, uh, they will stop the exports uh, and will not have a, re a reliable supply to Europe. Um, also, there's an imbalance of the plant sizes. Uh, the big lines worldwide are in, in the USA, uh, with, I think, uh, Kimur's having the, the biggest plant with uh, 300,000 metric tons production per year. Uh, of course, uh, another price driver is uh, the, um, the market segment. Uh, because the product choices are very, very narrow for uh, durable or even hyper-durable uh, and plastic applications. Uh, what do I mean with durable and hyper-durable applications? So durable applications are uh, all the outdoor applications that are um, weather fast, uh, that are um, actually sustaining in, um, in, the, in the weather, so UV exposure and uh, also um, exposure to uh, rain. Super durable uh, is better um, durability than just durable. Generally, um, this is about 10 years performance. Hyper durable, uh, that could be anything 20 or 30 years uh, warranty and of the uh, durability. There's very, very uh, um, low number of uh, titanium dioxide pigments actually fulfilling uh, this performance. Same for plastics applications where we've seen that the chemisorbed organics are only silane and uh, NOPA, and there's only uh, the top uh, companies uh, that have that uh, IP. Uh, and the top companies not including, actually there's only four companies in the world, um, because uh, Henan Billions uh, do not have the IP for that uh, chemisorbed organic for plastics. And um, so the demand and the supply of these uh, specialties, of course, uh, drives the pricing. Now, 
you might ask um, if titanium dioxide gets too expensive and is not available, uh, what can we do? Um, we can substitute with paint grades. Um, what else can we do? Are there any other pigments, any substitutes for titanium dioxide? And um, the short answer is no. Uh, and the reason is uh, what I mentioned here, we cannot cheat the light. The refractive index is the number one performance property for um, pigments um, with regards to both opacity but also whiteness. And um, we cannot cheat the light. A titanium dioxide is top. Um, we have the diamond, uh, which is even more expensive, uh, which is uh, a number three zinc sulfate. Uh, number four, we got zirconium di uh, oxide, zinc oxide, antimony oxide, lead carbonate. Uh, then we got uh, FP pigment. Actually, that chart uh, I have found on the FP pigment site. Um, and FP pigments, you might know, are producing uh, titanium dioxide coated pigments so uh, the core is not titanium dioxide uh, which uh, also explains the uh, the lower refractive uh, index now but even if um, you don't need the high refractive index you might need other properties of titanium dioxide you might need the bluish color you might need dispersibility you might need the food contact uh, or the um, um, the light stability uh, the durability of the titanium dioxide um, so I think uh, there is no substitution for titanium dioxide and uh, or very few cases where you can get away with uh, the mentioned substitutes. Uh, going all the way to uh, calcium carbonate um, or clay, uh, talc, uh, calcine clay, um, there's nothing quite like titanium dioxide. Now what are the quality issues with uh, titanium dioxide? Of course here we are talking about uh, both processes. Um, the main property uh, we talked about is the whiteness. Um, if we have low whiteness in the sulfate process, um, our yellow tonality, uh, we might have a feedstock overload with uh, chromophores, other chromophores that is, and that could include iron, uh, manganese, uh, that could be chromium or vanadium. And the solution is that we need tighter process control, tighter control on the feedstock, we need tighter specification for the feedstock. Um, for example, um, another problem could be um, that um, the pigment is not complying with uh, food contact. Um, that could be the case if the feedstock is overloaded with um, uh, arsenic or lead. Uh, and the solution again uh, is tighter feedstock control, tighter process control. Uh, we could have uh, processing issues, for example, in the chloride process, uh, overload with uh, calcium and magnesium on the sulfate process. Typically, iron uh, 2, iron 3 uh, is problematic, uh, or we could even have uh, radioactivity from uh, thorium. And again, uh, feedstock specification will solve that problem. In the sulfate process, one of the uh, important key performance uh, indicators is the uh, rutile content after the uh, calciner um, for rutile pigments. Um, but also um, another problem could be a small crystal size uh, and both are caused by incomplete calcination. So what we would uh, need is reprocessing in the calciner. Uh, we need in-process uh, sample control. Another problem in the sulfate process is actually if we have a, a large crystal size um, so we don't get the optical properties because the crystal is too big. Uh, and this could be uh, because of the over-calcination um, uh, or with uh, milling issues. Um, solution, again, uh, in-process uh, sampling control alongside the process, uh, the uh, uh, both processes, actually chloride and sulfate processes, uh, need to take uh, a lot of samples to make sure that uh, all things are aligned. With regards to plastics, we have already mentioned uh, what high moisture content on the pigment uh, could do. Um, this could also be because of uh, inappropriate storage um, and because of the pigment being out of shelf life. Now, uh, what is shelf life? Uh, shelf life really is only the retesting life. And typically, shelf life is uh, a year. And really what we're saying is this is the uh, retesting uh, period. So after one year, we should test uh, whether all properties are still fine and then we can continue uh, using it, this. 
Um, I was responsible for sales in uh, Eastern Europe uh, and the biggest Russian paint company store the big bag, uh, uh, the titanium dioxide in big bags outside, which is really, really not good because what you want is a dry storage, uh, also away from the sun, uh, away from uh, rain and the weather. So appropriate storage and quick consumption uh, can be quite uh, important for uh, um, the performance of titanium dioxide pigments. What about quality control? Uh, we mentioned about uh, the in-process uh, quality control. Uh, there's 50 plus in-process sample locations uh, due to the complexity of both processes. And uh, there's a very high quality control level of the top five players. The emerging players, uh, for example, uh, Chinese players are improving a lot. Um, they're being helped by uh, the many titanium dioxide expert consultants uh, that have worked with uh, various titanium dioxide manufacturers in Europe and the US. And um, we also have uh, indication of uh, quality by indirect analysis, as uh, mentioned. For example, if we had a high uh, content of nanomaterial, we certainly have a low opacity of the, the pigments. Or if you have high anatase content, uh, that will lead also to a low opacity of the pigment. Um, if we have contaminations, we get process issues. So there are a lot of hints along the uh, process sample uh, sampling that can uh, indicate us uh, what is wrong with uh, the pigment. And at that point, uh, I want to say quality has a price. Of course, that sampling and that, um, that uh, control process and process control has its price. So that is leading uh, me to the question of the market potential of emerging suppliers, mainly in China and uh, Asia, um, that uh, by now are building up uh, chloride processes, again with the help of uh, Western consultants. Um, but uh, will they uh, actually be serious competition to the top players like uh, Kimurs, uh, Tronox, uh, or for example, uh, Venator. So let's look at the uh, capability shopping list on that slide. Um, first, um, we need feedstock access. Now for the chloride process, we need a specific uh, pure feedstock, uh, and this uh, might be a problem, but generally I would say the feedstock or access uh, will be there for emerging uh, suppliers. A chloride process we talked about, uh, there's of course a lot of uh, IP, a lot of patents around the chloride process, uh, but uh, there are um, Chinese uh, chloride process uh, plants. Also, um, the particle size control, I think, uh, with the help of Western consultants, has improved a lot. Now let's go to the IP related to inorganic coating. And here I mentioned to you uh, for the hyper durability or super durability, we need dense silica coating. Uh, and this is specific, uh, um, a specific uh, patent. I think even the top players uh, are still fighting uh, about this IP for the dense silica coating. Uh, so uh, I don't think that any emerging players will be able to acquire um, the uh, license for these uh, patents. Organic coating, the same uh, for the chemisorbed uh, organics, silane or NOPA for high performance plastics, uh, no chance that uh, they will acquire this IP. So this will lock them out of highly durable coatings, uh, highly durable plastics, um, paper, uh, durable uh, paper, um, and also uh, will lock them out of high performance plastics. So uh, these are major markets that are um, quite important and that are uh, valuable markets for titanium dioxide. However, I think the market access will be just fine. Again, there's a lot of consultants, um, Western experts that can help emerging players get into the market. There's also um, um, the, um, uh, the interest of big paint companies. PPG is the world's biggest paint company. And uh, PPG uh, have uh, integrated into uh, titanium dioxide with a uh, Chinese uh, manufacturer. And um, uh, also the access to uh, the major market decorative paints is there for uh, emerging players. So um, I think uh, emerging players uh, will be uh, growing uh, but they will not be able to access uh, all the specialty markets requiring specific uh, IP. What about uh, sustainability and uh, carbon dioxide burden? Uh, as I mentioned, this is a topic uh, very close to my heart. 
these uh, three points are actually sourced uh, by Rec Ad uh, from uh, Rec Adams um, from article uh, again on the European Coatings Titanium Dioxide Forum 2018. And I found uh, them quite noteworthy, although they are uh, by now uh, two years old. Um, so Axel Nobel, uh, another big uh, chemical and uh, coatings company, aims to reduce its cradle to gate uh, carbon footprint um, between 2009 and 2020. Um, the focus is on TR2 pigment and uh, binder resins. Now you might ask uh, why TI2 pigment and uh, this is very interesting for me because I'm looking at the carbon burden for carbon black. And uh, so the point two, the uh, titanium dioxide manufacturing association uh, collected data from uh, 33 titanium dioxide plants uh, of which were 16 sulfate and 17 chloride. And the average footprint um, is um, uh, 5.2 tons carbon dioxide equivalent per ton of pigment in 2010 didn't change much. Uh, actually, it increased a little bit in 2012. It was uh, 5.3 tons carbon dioxide equivalent per ton of pigment. And this is about double the carbon dioxide burden of uh, carbon black. And I found this uh, quite interesting. So titanium dioxide has half the market size, but double the carbon dioxide burden. Now, the third one is interesting as well because, uh, and this gets a little bit into life cycle analysis and the importance of the uh, uh, boundaries of life cycle analysis. Um, and uh, Dr. Mike Bins, uh, formerly uh, with uh, Crystal, we know now um, uh, that Crystal uh, was acquired by Tronox, uh, back in 2013 noted uh, that the energy savings, so um, uh, with uh, white walls and roofs, um, infrared reflectance and less internal lighting uh, are quite uh, important. So uh, increased rather than decreased TI2 loading could be a better route towards lowering overall carbon dioxide emissions. So uh, we're investing some carbon burden, uh, which is spent on the titanium dioxide, uh, in order to save further carbon, uh, di uh, carbon dioxide burden uh, from the um, spent energy um, for, um, for example, air condition or heating. Now let's go to the nano discussion. Now this is uh, quite polemic uh, and uh, I can also understand that uh, there's a big uh, concern about just how dangerous uh, titanium dioxide can be um, and uh, in the context of the nano discussion. Now there's two definitions I'm giving you uh, for the uh, nano materials and there's the ISO definition which says that um, if uh, all particles in all three dimensions are between one and hundred nanometers, then we have a nanomaterial. But the EU definition uh, of 2011 is a different one. Uh, and that says that uh, it is enough um, if at least 50% of the particles have a size of one to hundred nanometers in only one dimension, um, which is of course a totally different uh, definition. In this slide, uh, I want to also give you a comparison, uh, a scale comparison between pigment and uh, nano titanium dioxide. And on the left hand bottom, uh, we can see uh, the rutile, uh, the big rutile, big crystal rutile, the normal or fine crystal rutile, and the uh, anatase titanium dioxide pigments. Um, I put them as round. Uh, of course, in uh, real life, um, pigments are not as round as that. Um, but uh, just for the, the size comparison. Now the nano titanium dioxide is uh, much smaller and uh, I took uh, information from Ishihara um, for both sol gel and calcination process uh, ultra fine uh, nano titanium dioxide. And you can see there's a big uh, size difference. What you also can see is that the calcination actually uh, helps with the or uh, causes the needle shape of the crystals which can be seen by the uh, microscopic picture uh, on the right hand uh, bottom. Now with that definition uh, we come to the question how much nanomaterial does pigment titanium dioxide contain? And uh, here I'm using um, data from Tioxide Europe, so um, now the nanomaterials 
and on the left hand side we can see a microscopic picture of a typical rutal calcina discharge. So this is just after the sulfate process um, and we haven't started the finishing process and um, we can see uh, a nice bell-shaped curve um, of the uh, crystal diameter in microns. We can see the average is at uh, around about uh, 0.24 um, which is optimized uh, for the optical performance. This is a coatings grade and the Milo uh, dictates us that uh, the crystal needs to have uh, this size in order to have maximum optical uh, properties. And we can also see we have about 3% uh, uh, weight are nano sized. Now this is not a lot, um, bearing in mind that uh, the average crystal size of anatase is rather uh, 0.15 micron, which is 150 nano, and that anatase pigments typically contain, uh, contain tenfold the nano material than rutile pigments, about 30%. Um, and uh, so this is important uh, to know. There's not a lot of nano material in uh, titanium dioxide. Also, um, on the last slide of this presentation, uh, we'll uh, look at um, how the titanium dioxide is bound in the polymer matrix and what is the most important route for assimilation. But what is the current reality? Um, in the last time I presented um, a presentation on titanium dioxide to um, actually Danone, uh, Evian, um, it was not clear yet uh, what the outcome will be, uh, but the worst case has now indeed happened. Uh, we have the EU classification of 2B, potentially carcinogenic by inhalation route. So what does it mean? Uh, we need to put very ugly labels. And the one is um, the labeling is uh, obligatory for all mixtures exceeding 1% titanium dioxide, which is practically everything that is containing titanium dioxide. And we need to put on the warning phrase, uh, number H351, warning suspected of causing cancer. And we need to label with a global harmonization symbol GHS08, uh, which you can see on the right hand side, which is showing um, a human uh, chest uh, with, um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know, with a star in the, in the middle. Um, the second thing is, um, according to REACH Article uh, 31, uh, material safety data sheets are obligatory for mixtures exceeding 0.1% uh, titanium dioxide. Uh, so this is even stricter. Uh, we need to, to put the phrase H210, material safety data sheet on demand. And there needs to be a tactile label, a danger label, which is a triangle, but it's not a flush triangle. It's not a printed triangle. It needs to be a tactile triangle so that even blind people can feel that triangle and they know that there is a, a danger with that, uh, uh, with that um, um, material mix. So this actually is my last slide uh, and a couple of comments on assimilation routes. Now let's look at the pictures first because uh, these are a couple of typical applications for titanium dioxide. Uh, you see some packaging, you see some coating, uh, you see some outdoor uh, plastics, uh, you see toothpaste, um, you see sunscreen, uh, you see also um, what looks like sugar but very often is titanium dioxide on uh, um, donuts. Um, you see um, coatings, um, actually UV protective coatings on uh, airplanes. Um, and you can see a pot of uh, normal decorative uh, paint, uh, which you might use uh, in your home. Um, the wall uh, I'm sitting uh, in front of, uh, I have just decorated uh, two months ago uh, and painted uh, my office uh, white. So these are typical application plastics uh, I haven't mentioned uh, in uh, electrical casings. Um, we said that the uh, classification is uh, because of the potential dangers by inhalation. So let's look at the assimilation routes. So the inhalation of titanium dioxide is an important aspect of the occupational safety in the manufacturing companies. When I was a narrow D engineer, uh, I uh, probably inhaled a lot of titanium dioxide pigments standing next to the micronizers, overfeeding the micronizers with solids, 
uh, they have something called a blowback and then uh, a valve releases and uh, it, it looks like um, in uh, winter wonderland everything's white and you're standing in a white cloud of titanium dioxide uh, pigment uh, i have baths in titanium dioxide uh, pigments um, but uh, companies that manufacture titanium dioxide need to take uh, precautions uh, one interesting um, um, fact about uh, titanium dioxide um, when I worked in the strategic marketing of Huntsman pigments we introduced agglomerated titanium dioxide and the idea was that uh, agglomerated titanium dioxide is easily dispersible but offers some advantages in uh, the um, pigment conveying and also the more precision in the pigment dosing and of course um, agglomerated titanium dioxide uh, is not 100% dust free but certainly is uh, dust reduced so that could also help in the dust exposure and in the exposure to uh, inhalation of uh, titanium dioxide however uh, most of the products uh, we're looking at uh, on this slide um, the uh, cutaneous contact or the uh, ingestion the oral route contact are more important than the uh, inhalation very rarely uh, unless you're sniffing um, the titanium dioxide powder coating of the donut um, very rarely for the consumer you have a, a chance an opportunity for inhaling titanium dioxide it's much more likely that you smear titanium dioxide on your skin uh, with your sunscreen or that you put uh, titanium dioxide in your mouth with your toothpaste um, and uh, for all the other uh, products uh, in most objects in fact titanium dioxide is bound in the polymer matrix so in the plastic matrix and uh, plastic um, products or in the uh, uh, paint film matrix uh, in the case of uh, paints and uh, coatings so the titanium dioxide is kept inside those uh, products only a leaching process could release the uh, particles there's one interesting um, feature uh, sometimes in uh, architectural outdoor coatings um, non-durable pigments are used uh, and they, um, the reason for that is called the chalking effect so what happens uh, um, can be explained with the sketch I put uh, in the left hand bottom and this is a sketch of the paint uh, or polymer film um, and you have in white the titanium dioxide crystals now what happens if um, the uh, titanium dioxide crystals do not protect the, um, the polymer matrix and then the polymer matrix is broken down then we actually uh, like indicated we can um, we have the titanium dioxide powder on the surface of the paint film and uh, that is actually uh, leading to a, some kind of self-cleaning effect of the uh, the coating um, it certainly makes a matte uh, surface uh, but also a safe cleaning surface and that could be desired in uh, outdoor coatings um, and again um, how can you uh, possibly come uh, to inhale this kind of pigment well if you go to um, um, a powdery uh, surface uh, coating uh, and uh, you put your nose very closely and sniff uh, but probably you don't do that very often so um, again my comment is uh, the um, the rating uh, for uh, titanium dioxide uh, the dangerous rating for titanium dioxide by inhalation route um, is not so dangerous in uh, the everyday use because the titanium dioxide uh, will be uh, in a polymer matrix and will keep in the polymer matrix um, and this is my my personal opinion i think uh, the public not knowing a lot of uh, about titanium dioxide is uh, overacting a little bit also um, the um, this rating is purely based on the size of the titanium dioxide not on the chemical nature and we have the same uh, discussion on carbon black nanoparticles and any kind of nanoparticles they will all have the uh, the rating uh, to b and uh, that leads me to the end of the presentation now in the live webinar we had uh, three questions uh, and the one question was uh, how does the labeling issue affect TiO2 coated mica effect pigments uh, there's no free titanium dioxide present there um, now I'm not a regulatory expert but I would say it uh, actually uh, it doesn't matter whether it's titanium dioxide 
uh, or any other material so it's just the particle size that is uh, playing a role here and um, uh, that that is what is uh, important second question uh, titanium dioxide in welding any info um, now in welding rods titanium dioxide is used as a as a chemical additive and uh, I don't know actually the uh, the, um, the reason for using titanium dioxide but here we don't need the opacity we don't need the optical properties uh, we're just putting pure titanium dioxide uh, it doesn't have to be coated um, it doesn't have to be doped uh, because uh, uh, we only need the substance titanium dioxide there might be something about the melt flow there might be something about uh, the uh, properties of the, the welding scene uh, that make uh, titanium dioxide uh, an important uh, component of uh, some welding rods. Uh, third question, can you inform about interrelationship between titanium dioxide and uh, carbon black? Uh, and this is a, a funny question. Um, I mean, the only reason I'm mentioning carbon black in the titanium dioxide webinar is um, I think there might be very, very few people like me that have worked uh, both in titanium dioxide and carbon black. And I find it uh, interestingly enough to, to compare uh, because they are on opposite points of the color sphere. Um, the L100 would be the ideal titanium dioxide, totally white, um, and the L0 would be uh, the ideal um, black, uh, the jet black, uh, the very deep black uh, by carbon black. Um, and uh, the mechanisms with the light are totally different. Um, whereas titanium dioxide is working by refraction and the refractive index is very very important and the key property uh, carbon black works by uh, absorption of light so if uh, carbon black uh, if uh, in a black surface can keep all the light in and doesn't uh, get um, uh, doesn't have any light coming out um, this is a super black um, surface and uh, so the uh, mechanism is uh, totally different uh, what I found interesting, uh, mentioned already, is that uh, the market size for titanium dioxide is half of that of carbon black, um, but uh, the carbon dioxide burden is uh, double. Um, I, found, I just found that interesting and uh, meaningful enough to mention in the uh, titanium dioxide webinar. So thank you very much for watching this webinar. If you have uh, any questions, uh, please uh, send me an email. Uh, please contact me on LinkedIn. Also, we have a very nice uh, group um, of um, titanium dioxide uh, on LinkedIn with uh, more than 9,000 uh, members. And uh, I recommend you, if you're interested in titanium dioxide, to, to join this group. Uh, there's a, a number of experts uh, like uh, Jack Blumfrucht and uh, Rick Adams. Uh, and uh, there's uh, always interesting posts about uh, titanium dioxide. So thank you again, uh, stay healthy, stay safe, and uh, hope to see you in the next webinar. Thank you very much.